Good morning. So good to see everybody this morning. Hope everyone's having a good day. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving. If you would be opening your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. This morning we're going to begin in verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. We do still have several of our number that are battling a variety of different illnesses. I think everybody's been passing around the sinus mess that has uh, been going around. and uh, It's good to see Brad back with us. Brad spent some time in the hospital this past week and glad that he's improving and able to be back with us this morning. Uh, we have several others that uh, have been sick, been in the hospital. Some have been able to go home. I think we have one, uh, one of our residents from the nursing home still in the hospital. So we need to remember each one of them in our prayers. Danny Brown, would you lead our prayer to start us off this morning? Well, as we've done each week that we've been looking at chapters 24 and 25, I want to begin by reminding you what we see Jesus doing in these two chapters. Back at the beginning of chapter 24, Jesus has gone to the Mount of Olives and his disciples come to him and they ask him three questions. The first is when is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? You know, that's a subject that in previous chapters he's told the Jews this was something that was going to happen. So now his disciples have come and said, when's this going to happen? What do we need to be watching for? Their second question, what about your second coming? What's going to be the signs of that? What, uh, what are the things we need to be watching for? And then the third question, the end of the world. When is that going to take place? What do we need to be watching for in that regard? Well, up to this point, we've seen his answer to these first two questions. When is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? What's going to be the signs of your coming? Well, we'll where we begin this morning is Jesus giving an answer to that third and final question, that being his second coming, or I'm sorry, the, the day of judgment. Well, notice beginning in verse 31. He says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory... So he's, he's piggybacking this on what we've seen just previously in him talking about his second coming and what it's going to be like. He, but he then, continuing, transitioning into this new thought, he said, but when that happens, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Now, Whenever we look at what this passage tells us, we see that these two events, Jesus' second coming and the day of judgment, are going to run uh, just concurrent with each other. Jesus is going to come again, and then immediately following that is going to be the day of judgment. Notice that it says that when Jesus comes in his glory, so when Jesus comes again, when the angels have come with him, you know, the Bible talks about the fact that the angels are going to come, that there's going to be the shout of the archangel, the trumpet of God is going to sound. So when Jesus comes again, then 
he is going to be seated upon the throne of glory. Now this illustration of a throne of glory is indicative of two things. It's indicative of judgment and it's indicative of authority. We know that Jesus, and we're going to talk about this more in our, our lesson during the worship hour, Jesus was given all authority. God gave him all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus is the one that has the authority to judge the souls of mankind. And so this picture of him seated upon a throne, it indicates that authority position that has been given to him, but it's also indicative of the judgment that's going to commence immediately following his second coming. Now, this idea is one, and I know that we've brought this up a couple of times previously, but this passage is one that we can look at to show that this idea that Jesus' second coming is going to take place at some point years before the end of time. There are some that believe that Jesus came again in A.D. 70, concurrent with the fall of Jerusalem. There are some that believe that Jesus is going to come again at the time of the rapture, uh, this premillennial theory that one day all of the faithful are simply going to disappear and that is going to usher in the thousand-year reign of Christ and all of this. And then after this thousand years plus seven years of good times, seven years bad times, then there's going to be a third coming, so to speak. Jesus is going to come again. And that's when the day of judgment is going to take place. Well, whenever you look at the language that's used in this passage, that's not what Jesus is saying at all. What he's saying is that these two things are going to happen essentially at the same time. Jesus is going to come again, and immediately he's going to begin judging the souls of mankind. And so continuing down into verse 32, we see him giving us a little bit more detail about this. It says, and before him, meaning before his throne, before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So the illustration we see is that once Jesus is seated upon that throne of judgment, then every person from every nation, from every age of time is going to come before him. And part of the judgment that we see taking place is going to be a separation He's going to separate, as it says here, the sheep from the goats. The sheep we see pictured many times in the scriptures as being those who are faithful unto him. Goats are seen as the ones that are unfaithful. And so ultimately this is saying that there's going to be a division take place. Those that are faithful on one side, those that are unfaithful on the other side. And as it says in 33, he's going to set the sheep on his right side. Well, the right side or the right hand was always seen as a sign of approval, was always seen as uh, that which was good, that which was acceptable. And so the sheep, it says, they're going to be accepted by him. They're going to be on his right side or at his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now, you may remember on Wednesday night, from our study of the book of Revelation, I mentioned to you that there are several passages of Scripture that I think lend itself to this idea that judgment is going to happen a certain way. Now, there are certain things about the day of judgment that we have to leave up to speculation because the Bible just doesn't tell us. But I think there's quite a few indicators in the Scriptures to show that those who are found to be on the right hand, those who are found to be faithful to God, they're going to be allowed to enter into heaven before the judgment of the wicked takes place. I think that we see numerous passages of Scripture that would indicate that, and we talked about some of those on Wednesday night. Um, if you didn't have an opportunity to hear that and want to, you can go back and listen to that on YouTube. But... There are several different arguments that we can look at to that fact. 
But notice it talks about that they're going to be separated, they're going to be divided. But then notice as we come on down through this chapter, who does he start out talking to first? To the faithful. To the sheep. To those who are righteous. Then shall the king, verse 34, say unto them on his right hand, those that he has found acceptable, those that um, have been faithful to him, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So starting out, he's talking to this whole group. For a long time, I had this mental image of each person individually going and standing before Christ and them being either found guilty or innocent and sentenced all in one motion. And then each person individually is like, okay, you can go into heaven. So you go this way, you go through the gate. But the more we study the scriptures, I don't necessarily think that, it, that that's exactly how it's going to happen. Because this dividing that it's talking about here I tend to believe that that's talking about you standing before the judgment seat of Christ and he determines which side you're going to be on. You're going to be faithful or unfaithful. And then after that division has taken place, then as we see in this text, all of those that are on his right hand, the gates of heaven are going to be thrown open and they're going to be granted access. But then you have those on the left. They're standing there, they're watching all of this. And I've shared with you before that I personally believe that one of the punishments of hell is going to be the psychological anguish of knowing that you could have avoided that place. And you think, all of those individuals standing there watching all of these others enter into heaven. The great joy that is being felt by those but then you're standing there knowing what awaits. Yes, ma'am. We're going to be with the dead, right? Do what? It's also going to be with the dead because they rise first. Right, right. So well, you the notice the it. Dead and, the, and the living together. Right, right. Um, you notice as it says here, it says everyone from all nations, I mean all people yeah. are going to be there and... Yes, in, in the second coming of Christ, you know, it talks about that the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together uh, to meet the Lord in the air. But we all then will go and stand before this throne, as it talks about here. We're going to stand before that judgment seat, and we're going to be judged based upon the way we've lived our life. But as I look at this passage, I think that final sentencing that we see, I think that's going to be for the whole group. I don't think that's necessarily going to be, okay, you're faithful, you go into heaven right now. You're faithful, you go over here with this group. Because notice what it says. It says he's going to turn to those on his right hand, those that he's already separated. And he's going to say, you're blessed. You enter into the blessings of your Father. Now, like I said, a lot of this, these are things we like to think about, things we like to speculate on. But a lot of this, we're just going to have to wait and see. We're just going to have to wait and see. But notice what he says about those on his right hand. He says, Come, ye blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know, God had a plan for man's redemption in place before he ever created man. The Bible instructs us in that fact. So before the foundation of the world, God already had this plan in place that the faithful were going to be able to go to heaven. And he said, those of you that are found faithful, he said, you're going to inherit that. Those of you that are blessed, you're going to inherit that kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. But notice what he said they had to do in order to receive it. He says, For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. 
I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Now, I want you to think about this from this standpoint. Notice that it says that all people from all nations were standing before him. How many people that have ever lived on the face of this earth ever provided Jesus with a physical meal or provided him with clothing or provided him personally with anything? Not very many. Only those that were alive during the time of his earthly ministry. And so it's logical the response that they make back to him because many of these people had never met Jesus in person. But yet he's saying, you're being blessed because you fed me. You gave me something to drink. You provided for me. Well, Jesus, when did we do that? We've, we've never met you before. When did we see you hungry and feed thee or thirsty and give thee drink? When did we see you a stranger and take thee in or naked and clothe thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? Jesus, when did we do this? You're saying we're being blessed and heaven's going to be our home because we've done these things. Well, when did we do this? They didn't understand. They thought that he was talking about they had done that directly to him when he was physically in the flesh. But notice the response. Verse 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren... You've done it unto me. And so he says, by performing these deeds, by being hospitable and caring and, and basically living out the Christian life as you should, he says, when you have been a blessing to another person, he says, essentially, you've been a blessing to me as well. And certainly we know from the writings of Paul that this is something that could apply not only to fellow Christians, but it could apply to anyone. For he says that as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, but especially unto the household of faith. But notice that Jesus says, he says that whenever you have had this type of behavior and this type of attitude toward those who were in this kind of need, He said, essentially, you were doing that for me as well. And so he says, you didn't have to do it for me personally, but you did it for me, or one translation that I saw, and I I don't really, I don't think it is completely accurate with the passage, but I think it does kind of fit the context that we see. One translation says that you have done it in my name or done it by my authority. And like I said, I don't think that that is exactly what the original Greek is saying, but I think in the context of what he's saying, I think that certainly would apply. Because these are things that we are doing, executing our Christian faith. Thereby, we're doing it with the authority of Christ. Christ sees that. We receive a blessing from doing that. Questions or comments up to this point? That's right. Their whole life was about their self, not, not doing good for others. That's right. That's pretty obvious. Thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, now he's going to turn to the ones on the left hand. Everything he said so far has been that which is good. Notice he says, come to me. He says, come and inherit this kingdom. So it's quite possible that in the saying of this, All of those on the right hand have already entered into heaven at the point that he turns to those on his left hand. As I said, that's speculating, but I think that the text certainly uh, lends itself to that idea. He turns to those on his left hand and he says, depart from me. Notice the ones on the right, he says, come to me. Come and receive this blessing. But those on the other side, he says, get away. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
So starting out, who did he say that this kingdom of heaven has been prepared for? For the faithful. For those that are righteous. He said, this has been prepared from the foundation of the world. But notice what he says about the others. He says, this place, this was created not for man. This was created for the devil and his angels. Now, I've often heard this explained, that God initially never intended to have to condemn anyone. That he created Adam and Eve and provided them with the tree of life. He anticipated that man would always be faithful, but then sin entered in. Now, again, there's so many questions there because you could argue, well, if God is all-knowing, didn't he know that man was going to sin? And there's so many different variables there we can look at and just say, we don't know. But what the text does tell us, heaven was created for the righteous, but hell, hell was created for the devil. The devil and his angels. But, that's okay. The devil is the prince of earth. Do what now? The devil is the prince of the world. Right, he is is described that way, of of this world, of the carnal world, yes. And, you know, another way that I've heard that described is where it talks about the devil and his angels. Um, One translation that I saw... uh, It said the devil and his minions or the devil and his followers. And so some could argue, well, that's not necessarily saying that it was created just with the devil and those other angels that fell from heaven in mind, that it was created for the devil and all of his followers in mind. And I I think that that makes sense to look at it that way. But from the text, whenever we look at the term that's used here, it, it is the Greek term for angels. And so, however you want to interpret that, we see that this is a place that God, whether he created it with man in mind or not, it's a place that he does not want man to have to go. This is a place that has been created for the worst of the worst. The devil and his angels, those who rebelled against God. But he said this is the place that they're going to depart to. And notice why, and this is kind of an echo of what we saw previously, but just the flip side of it. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was thirst, or I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered or a thirst? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. So you see the reverse. Those on the right hand, he said that you've done all of these things for me. But they said, when? We we don't recognize that we've done this. How, How did we do this for you? But those on the left hand notice that they are trying to rationalize with Jesus. Jesus is saying, well, you didn't do any of this stuff for me. Well, what do you mean we didn't do any of this stuff for you? When did we see you this way and and not provide those things for you? So you see on both hands, they're looking at this saying, well, Jesus, we've, we've never seen you before. We've not been in your physical presence. When did we do these things? But on the part of those on the left hand, they're getting defensive. Those on the right, they were kind of confused. They, they, well, you're telling us we're blessed because we did, did all these things. Well, tell us when. Tell us when we saw you, when we fed you, when we did all these things. But these over here, uh uh we've never seen you before. When did you come to us and ask for something to eat or something to drink and us not give it to you? <coughs> When did we see you without clothing and not give you something to put on? Jesus, tell us when we didn't do these things. 
Well, notice his response. Very similar to what he said to those on the right. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And so as David said in, in his comment just a few minutes ago, we see this attitude there of, of selfishness. On one hand, you had those who had been judged as righteous and they were told, well, you've done all of these wonderful things. Well, they looked at that and they said, well, when did we do that? They didn't, they didn't recognize that they had done those things. They weren't coming before Jesus saying, hey, look at me. Look at everything that I've done. Well, you remember in another case, Jesus talks about the day of judgment. And he talks about that there were going to be some on the day of judgment that are going to come before him with great pride. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do all of these wonderful things in your name? Defending themselves. Just as we see here, Jesus, when did we see you that way and not do those things? No. Notice the ones that he sees that are faithful. They are ones that have been carrying out their faith, but they're not keeping a checklist. They're not keeping a running tally of everything they do. They're not making sure that their good deeds are seen by others. Notice in this case, they didn't even recognize themselves that they had done these things. But Jesus says, I saw it. I know the way you've lived your life. I know your attitude. I know that you've cared for others. I know that you've been in tune to the things taking place. He said, when you did this in my name, he said, you did this for me. But on the other hand, he says, I've seen your attitude. He said, I know that there have been times where you could have helped people, you could have fed the sick, or you could have, you could have clothed those that were naked. You could have been there to help others and provide for them. And you didn't do it. One thing that I look at oftentimes, and I heard a lesson one time that was talking about the Jewish leaders on the Day of Judgment. And the things that we saw, especially with the scribes and the Pharisees and the way that they treated others, the way they treated Christ, and then all of these things that the Bible tells us are going to be presented on the Day of Judgment. Those Jewish leaders, many of them, the ones that yelled out, crucify, they're going to be standing before the very one that they crucified. And not only that, you look at some of the things that we saw in uh, our study of the life of Christ, the things that he says that these Jewish leaders were involved in. He talks about them taking advantage of people. He talks about them stealing widows' houses. He talks about them uh, putting, putting undue pressures upon people, not providing for them in the way that they should. Folks, I can't help but whenever I read a passage like this, I see many of those people on the left hand. But Jesus, we were the religious elite. We were the ones that were doing what we thought was right. Depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. Verse 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. One point that we could make from this, there is a growing sentiment in the religious world today. And there, there's a few in the Lord's church, not very many, that have begun to promote this idea that hell is not eternal. That hell is simply uh, what they call an annihilation, annihilationism. And that when you are cast into the lake of fire, you simply cease to exist. Your eternal nature dies and you cease to exist. Well, folks, that's not what the Bible teaches. 
Consistently, the Bible teaches us that this is an eternal punishment, an eternal burning. In fact, the, the Greek term that is often translated as hell literally has the translation or literally has the definition, the place of eternal burning. But what happens so often and where much of this ideology has originated is in this idea, folks, we don't like to think about people being lost, do we? We don't like to think about anyone burning for eternity. That's not a thought we like to think about. That's why we don't talk as much about hell as we do heaven. It's not as pleasant of a thought at all. And so what has happened, people have begun to develop these ideas that kind of lessen the severity. Well, yes, our, our loved ones, they may not have made it to heaven, but they're not, they're not being tortured for all of eternity. They, they've ceased to exist. They were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death, and that second death is the annihilation of their soul. Well, if that was the case... Folks, that's really not a punishment. It's not. Well, the Bible teaches us very plainly, and this is one of the passages that do so, that this is going to be an eternal punishment. Just as heaven is going to be an eternal reward, hell is going to be an eternal punishment. Okay, any questions or comments? Well, there are some people that try to claim that there's going to be two judgments. Basically, that there's going to be a judgment at the point that you die, and then there's going to be another final judgment. But the way that I have often described that, and the way that I've heard many others describe that, Danny, when we pass away, immediately we're going to know where we're going. Because if you look... At Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, he was met by a company of angels. Carried his soul away to Abraham's bosom or to paradise. Folks, if you're lost, God's not going to send his angels for you. But then on the other hand, you have the rich man said his eyes were closed in death and he lifted up his eyes in torment. And so the way that I've often heard that described, and I think this is a good way of looking at it, is when we die, that initial judgment has already taken place, but we still have to stand before the judgment seat and be sentenced. Yes, ma'am. Real quick, in my professional uh, nursing, when I did nurse, I saw a few people pass away. As I witnessed, Well, there's so much in the spiritual realm that the Bible describes as the secret things that belong to God. Yes. Things that have not been revealed to us. 
And, you know, the Bible also tells us there are things that have not been revealed to us because we can't comprehend it. I mean, our human minds can't comprehend it. And so there's no telling what all takes place in the spiritual realm. I mean, that, that's not for us to know. That's, it's hard to describe it as a physical assessment, but if this was something that they were laying down and they just sat up, a little, you know, maybe 30 degrees, and their eyes open, and they lay down and gone. And, and you do hear a lot of accounts like that. <laughs> And so, I mean, there could there could be something to that. I mean, something that that in this physical realm we don't we don't see, we don't comprehend, because, like I said, the Bible tells us there's a lot of things that have not been revealed to us. But what has been revealed are the things that pertain to this life and and living a godly life here. But as we see, especially as we've looked at the Book of Revelation. Folks, there's a lot of things taking place in heaven right now. There's a lot of things taking place in the spiritual realm right now that we don't see. Yes, sir. You know, one other thing that refutes, refutes the uh, thing about annihilation in my mind is the scripture says at that time we will be changed and made like him. Him is God Almighty, Christ. It's going to be you're going to be given at that point eternal existence. That's right. We're going to be changed and made like him. There won't be any annihilation. You're either going to be an eternal existence in a punishment or a, or a, in heaven and rejoice. That's right. No other way about it. Yep, that's right. All right, we're going to stop right there. Lord willing, next Sunday morning we'll start chapter 26.